Hi everybody and welcome back to Seattle Civil War Legacy. Uh, today we're doing something a little different. Um, usually we focus specifically on um, the veterans in Seattle in the suburbs in King County, but today we're about 25 miles north of Seattle in the city of Everett to visit the historic Evergreen Cemetery. Uh, there are about 150 Civil War veterans here um, and we're gonna get today a tour uh, from a friend of our page, Gene Fosheim who is a historian here in Everett. He uh, specializes in tours and history of, of Everett Cemetery, uh, or Evergreen Cemetery here in Everett. Um, and and uh, he's gonna be our guide today and show us around to a number of Civil War veterans and tell us about uh, some of the things that you might like to come and see here in Evergreen Cemetery if you're interested in Seattle and our area's Civil War history. So this is Gene, he'll tell us well, good morning, everybody. I'm Gene Fossheim. I've lived in Everett all my life, but I've spent a lot of my life visiting cemeteries all over the world. So this one is my favorite because it's my home cemetery. I've got all my family members buried here. But we're going to talk about this oldest part of the cemetery to start with. The Lich Gate down here is where the bodies arrived. In fact, there used to be a rail bringing them right here from downtown Everett. And then, of course, the most famous item in the whole area is the uh, famous Rucker tomb up here, which is 30 feet high, beautiful granite, has 22 crypts in it. But that's a whole other story for another tour that I do. We're going to talk about the Civil War today. Now, this cemetery, Everett, was uh, created in 1892, 1893, when it was formed. And this cemetery was uh, built in 1898. So bodies from various cemeteries were brought here and then from 1898 and on this was the cemetery in Everett and uh, as Richard said we've got 150 Civil War graves here we're going to visit about a dozen or so today so we're ready to go okay uh, first we're going to talk about Joseph Kaysen because he's right here in the GAR plot the GAR plot was actually purchased in 1899 and the monument we were just standing at was built in 2004 and all these graves were restored. We've got new markers or the old markers were placed in concrete so they could uh, look a lot better. Some of them tip over. But Joseph Kaysen here, I'm going to use my notes because I can't memorize all this stuff when I'm an old guy like this. So he enlisted in 1861 in the 9th New York Cavalry Company, Company M at 24 years old. He was promoted to position or rank of blacksmith. The 9th was at Chancellorsville, Gettysburg, and Appomattox. So Kaysen was mustered out in July of 1865 at Cloudsville, uh, Clouds Mill, Virginia as a private. Although he never was never wounded, in later years he received a $6 a month pension for a kidney injury caused by his horse. In 1895 he wrote, relocated here to Everett for unknown reasons and later became a resident of the Washington Soldiers Home in Ording, Washington. In April of 1902, he was traveling from Orton to Everett on the steamship City of Everett and suffered a stroke. He died the next day at 65 years of age. And that's really the, all the, the main information we have on him. Many of these veterans, in fact, almost all of them, came out west to meet up with their sons, daughters, or family and retire here or start a business here. And that's why we have so many Civil War veterans in this area. Okay, we have next here is Anton Kritzberg. He was born in 1826 in Prussia, came to Pennsylvania in 1849, and married a wife, lived in Wisconsin. They had four kids together. He enlisted in 1864 at the end of the year, and he was about 38 years of age, which was far above the 26-year average of the Civil War soldier. He likely received an enlistment bonus of at least $100, while the wage of a private was $13 a month at the time. His military service, as many veterans, um, proved to be a medical disaster. Within six months, he was in the hospital with dropsy, and he was given a medical discharge in May of 1865. So his time in the military was very, very short. He settled in Green Bay, Wisconsin, got divorced. Um, he was given a disability pension of $17 a month because of rheumatism. And he claimed all kinds of ailments, including piles, lung and spleen problems, broken left wrist, and loss of hearing. He was living with a son here, Hugo, when he died in Everett in 1906. And the neat thing about him 
is his family is still here in Everett. Well, here we have Joseph Martlett, and he was a real interesting character. He was the oldest of 10 kids, born around 1846, and he was born in France, close to Paris. He ended up a farmer in Beloit, Wisconsin. At the end of August 1864, he entered the U.S. Army and spent most of his time with the 42nd Wisconsin in Cairo, Illinois, and was discharged in June of 1865. He married uh, Mary Catherine Graininger after the war, 1868, had 13 children. In 1888, 20 years later, he mysteriously left home to go to work in the woods and never came back. It appears the burden of the responsibility, including two sets of twins and a wife who was pregnant again, was too much and he abandoned them. Marlett showed up in Granite Falls here in 1890 Meanwhile, his wife was turned down for a pension after declaring herself a Civil War widow. In 1905, Joseph claimed to be a widower himself and an unemployed invalid on a pension request. He died in Everett Hospital on May 26, 1905 from the obstruction of the bowels and appendicitis. So lots of kids, lots of problems with this family. There you go. Cicero Hunter, he's a fascinating guy. He was born in March of 1842 in Kentucky, and he was a slave until he was five years old when he somehow received his freedom. Um, he was African-American. He could also read and write, very unusual. He enlisted in March of 1864 in Washington, D.C. in the 32nd Infantry Colored Troops, Company K. He joined under the name John Clark from Detroit. He mustered out in August of 1865 as a private and joined the Merchant Marines until 1869. Then he likely worked as a railroad porter in Philadelphia. In 1907, Cicero was living in Bellingham, and in 1910, he had his own farm up in Granite Falls, just about 20 miles from here. Hunter died in the Everett Hospital in 1916, and he was first buried in Everett's historic Greenwood Cemetery, which is right over by the Ford dealer in Everett, South Everett on Evergreen Way, Old Highway 99. Well, everybody in that cemetery was dug up and put here in Evergreen over the years, in his case, 1916 or a little bit later. At least we think a lot of them were dug up. So next time a person goes over there, you're probably parking on top of an old graveyard that with a lot of bodies still there. His body was actually moved here in 1921 and his grave was unmarked until our Civil War group came in and purchased a marker to put on here. We have no idea why he changed his name, but fascinating history for one of our colored troops. Well, Daniel Budd here is not too far from a hunter, and uh, he was born on a farm in Wayne County, Indiana. He enlisted in the 9th Battery Indiana Light Infantry or light artillery, I'm sorry. December 1861, so right at the beginning of the war, during the ill-fated spring 1864 Red River Expedition in Louisiana and Texas, Private Bud contracted chills and fever from exposure, but did survive and was promoted to corporal. After the war, he moved to Minneapolis, got married, had a child, and became a stonemason. In 1892, he applied for a government disability pension based on his inability to perform hard work because of his health, which was destroyed, of course, while in the Army. At the time of his death, he was receiving a $50 a month pension. His wife died in 1910, and Daniel moved with his daughter's family to Ferry County, and then eventually moved up here and lived on 1231 Lombard in Everett. He died in September of 1920. Next, we're gonna talk about Captain John Scott Muzzy, Jr. from Ashtabula, Ohio, born in 1832. He's married twice, had five kids. He enlisted in the U.S. Army Infantry at 30 years of age, and he was listed as five foot nine inches tall, fairly tall for those days with blue eyes and auburn hair. Muzzy's military tenure was amazing. He started as a private in the 111th Illinois Volunteer Infantry before being commissioned as a second lieutenant in the newly formed United States Colored Troops Regiment. In February of 1865, 
He was brought up before a court-martial and honorably dismissed from the service, but he soon received another commission at a higher rank of first lieutenant. He was discharged after the war in 1866 and became a plasterer in Salem, Illinois. By 1910, Muzzy and two of his daughters moved to Everett, where he died here in 1920. So some fascinating history. He was the officer with a colored unit during the war. Okay, we have a very interesting guy here, Lewis Haybrock. And if that sounds familiar, you might have climbed up the Haybrock Lookout on Highway 2 on the way to Stevens Pass. There was a town of Haybrock there where Haybrock had a sawmill, and he's the originator of that sawmill and that town. So he was born in Prussia in 1837 and immigrated to America 15 years later. He enlisted at the beginning of the war in 1861 for one year in the Confederate Lynchburg Rifle Grays. This is our only Confederate here in the Everett Cemetery that we're aware of. The unit became Company A within the 11th Virginia Infantry. He was discharged as a private in September of 1862. We don't know why. In 1880, he was married to a lady named Mary from England and working in Omaha, Nebraska as a machinist. By 1900, they had moved to Snohomish County where Lewis owned the Haybrock Lumber Company sawmill, which is two and a half miles southeast of the present day index. You'll see it on some of the older maps. There's really nothing there anymore. The location became the town of Haybrock with a population of 250 people in 1912. He passed away from liver cancer at 76 years old. So you can see this is original marker right here, and this is one that the Civil War group put up next to it, same person. Hey, we have a Navy guy right here. This is John Brooks, and he was born April 30th, 1846 in Essex County, New York. He enlisted in the U.S. Navy for one year at the age of 17 years old. He was described as five foot five, dark complex with blue eyes and brown hair, and a farmer. He became a landsman, a novice with no sea experience, but during his one year of service rose to the rank of seaman and became a Navy bugler. He and his brother were assigned to four vessels on the Mississippi River, including the gunboat USS Essex. While aboard the side wheeler steamer USS General Sterling Price in March of 1864, they participated in the ill-fated Red River Expedition into Texas. During this operation, the Price captured a number of bales of rebel cotton, so that was their claim to fame. When his year, uh, one year enlistment was completed, John resettled in New York, moved to Illinois, Pittsburgh, Wisconsin. He got married, had four kids, and ended up out here because of the great farmland. So he became a farmer out west in 1902. He died at his home in Everett at 69 years of age, and he uh, died of colectitis. <laughs> can't pronounce that very well. So there's John Brooks. Okay, this is uh, Robert Beecham, and he certainly is the most interesting character probably from the Civil War era here and after in the cemetery. One of the most interesting characters here, period. Quite an accomplished guy. That's his marker, this is his wife. And here's a nice brass plaque that was put in by the Daughters of the American Revolution a few years back. He was born in 1838 in New Brunswick, Canada. When he was seven years of age, his parents moved to Sun Prairie, Wisconsin. Beecham enlisted in the 2nd Wisconsin Infantry Company H in May of 1861. In addition to combat, he spent time in the Army hospitals, suffered from various illnesses, and despite his illnesses, he was soon promoted to corporal. During the first day of fighting in Gettysburg, Corporal Beecham was captured and confined in Richmond, Virginia. In late July 1863, he was paroled north and hospitalized. In late 1863, Corporal Beecham applied for and received a first lieutenant's commission in one of the new regiments of colored troops being formed in the Union Army. He joined the 23rd United States Colored Troops Volunteer Infantry in early 1864. In July, Lieutenant Beecham was wounded in the right thigh and taken captive, imprisoned at Camp Asylum, North Carolina. He was not freed until March of 1865, and then he was promoted, he was promoted to captain while he was still a, a prisoner in 1864. 
Beecham married Emma Watkinson in 1864 and they had three children. After the war, the Beechams moved to a farm in Litchfield, Minnesota. In 1894, they moved to Everett, where he was employed as an insurance agent, lawyer, street commissioner, and newspaper man. So he was a very important person in the very early days of Everett. His greatest prominence came through his writings of poetry and philosophy. Beecham wrote two books, As If It Were Glory, Robert Beecham's Civil War from the Iron Brigade to the Black Regiments and Gettysburg, the pivotal battle of the Civil War. His last job, a 16-year stint as Supreme Court bailiff, came to an end when his eyesight and health began to fail. He died in 1920 at 82. Robert Beecham, what a life he had. Very interesting guy. Hi, Richard again. Um, so, I, I'm really, he, he is definitely the most significant uh, figure among military, Civil War history-wise, in the cemetery. Uh, this, the second Wisconsin, I think many of you will recognize from the Iron Brigade, um, which is, of course, famous for their fight at Gettysburg. Uh, they earned the nickname, actually, at, the, um, at Gainesville, kind of also known as Second Manassas in general. Um, and he shares a, a little bit more uh, a historical track with Seattle's veterans. Um, you'll notice a lot of the stories here. The guys came kind of late. Um, you know, they came, maybe started a business, came with their children. He, you know, Gene mentioned that several times. Um, but he, his, his, his military history as well as uh, his sort of early significance um, really parallels a lot with the stories and the things you'll see with Seattle's veterans. And in particular is the fact that he was captured on the first day's fight at Gettysburg. We have a number of Iron Brigade uh, veterans in the state. There's a, um, a handful in Seattle. Uh, we, have, we have Beecham here in, in Everett. Um, and a number of them were actually wounded and captured and imprisoned together at, um, on their way. They were captured, or sorry, wounded and or captured uh, together on July 1st, 1863 at the fight at Gettysburg. So it's kind of neat to think that they, they were they were sort of fighting together uh, in, in whether they knew each other, a guy from the 7th Wisconsin and then a guy from the 24th Michigan and a guy from the 2nd Wisconsin. They probably didn't know each other personally. Um, after the war, their lives were incredibly divergent, but then they would come back together. But the one place that they may have had actual contact and interesting overlap was following uh, their capture when they marched together up the Shenandoah Valley. They were sent into Richmond to Libby Prison, NCOs and officers. Um, uh, Justice Rockwell comes to mind. He was captured in the railroad cut. He's 97th New York in Seattle. He lived in Snohomish for a while after the war as well. So um, it, it's kind of neat to think that these guys actually did have some contact with each other here based on their sort of coincidental contact that they had during the war. Um, in particular, we have in this Snohomish County, King County area, a, a, a little core group of guys that were all captured together sort of in this fighting in the same area at Gettysburg on July 1st, imprisoned together at Libby Prison and then, um, and then kind of went about their lives afterwards, their veterans' lives. And then, uh, you know, who knows if they had, how close their contact was once they got back here. But I would assume that Beecham probably knew some of the other Civil War uh, veterans in Seattle and he likely may have known some of the others that were imprisoned, captured and imprisoned together with him at Libby. Uh, in late 1863. Okay, we have uh, Louis Carbino right here, and he's from New York, born in 1837. He married Rosina, had three children, and then he enlisted in Captain Smith's Company New York Volunteers. They later became Company G of the 60th New York Volunteer Infantry and were in action in Chancellorsville and Gettysburg. Private Carbino was medically discharged in 1864 in Alexandria upon a surgeon's certificate which claimed he had been unfit for duty for the past 60 days because a functional disease of the heart contracted while in service. One year later, he again enlisted back in the Army, this time in the heavy artillery, so he must have got well. In May of 1871, his wife died, and less than a year later, he married Martha Popper. In 1902, the family moved from New York to Everett. 
Three years later, the farm laborer was injured while blasting rock, resulting in the amputation of his leg. After his second wife's death, Lewis moved to Alexandria, Minnesota, which got my interest because that's where my mom was born. And in 1919, he was back in Lowell here in Everett, just down the hill, where he died in 1923. At his death, he was receiving a healthy sum of $50 a month based on his disability track, backtrack to his Army days. So another story of a guy coming out here to retire and settle here in the Everett area in Puget Sound. And here we have uh, Theo Rock. He was Canadian, born in 1836, moved to Minnesota where he married a Minnesota girl, Marguerite, and became a carpenter. They eventually had 12 children. He enlisted in the 1st Wisconsin Cavalry Company L in February of 1865 toward the end of the war. His regiment reached Nashville, then Alabama, where it gen joined General Wilson's cavalry expedition. In early May, a detachment of the 1st set out to search for Confederate President Jefferson Davis. Theo mustered out in July in Edgefield, Tennessee. In 1901, Theo left his wife in Minnesota and moved to Everett and lived at 23rd and Wetmore downtown. He remarried in 1914 in Vancouver, Canada. His new bride was Sylvia Parr, a widow of Civil War veteran Thomas Parr in May of 1917. They were residing at uh, 2231 Norton where Theo died. He'd been receiving a pricely sum of 42 a month in disability payments and his wife is here and her husband's here and Theo is there, but we put his marker here, <laughs> okay? Well, here we have the last one on my tour today. This is Daniel Bennett with his wife here. Bennett was in the 7th Michigan Infantry in 1861, served in companies A and K. Private Bennett was wounded in the mouth during the Battle of Fair Oaks, Virginia, during Union General George McClellan's Virginia Peninsula campaign. He was wounded a second time in 1864 during the Battle of Spotsylvania Courthouse in Virginia. This wound was serious with a rifle ball passing through his right shoulder, fracturing his clavicle and scapula bones. He was granted a medical discharge in April of 1865. In 1870, he and his wife and daughter were residing in Michigan and then Nebraska, and they moved to Elgin, Oregon. And then in 1910, they arrived here in Everett. The tragic end of this story was in November 1919, the aging Bennett stepped off the curb on a very rainy evening on 20th and Broadway in North Everett. He was struck by a car. The car was driven by Fire Chief Al Taro. Bennett's legs were both broken, one arm was fractured, suffered a scalp wound and internal injuries and that led to his death. So a very tragic story. And in another story we have is Chief Al Taro was killed in an auto accident just a few years later in downtown Everett, one of the real infamous accidents where we lost three firemen. So that's Daniel Bennett. Hi there, I'm finished up with the Civil War tour, but I just want to remind everybody that Historic Everett in town here is a great historic preservation organization, and they usually have me lead a tour in the summertime of the cemetery where I cover many, many different things. I also do private tours, so let me know if you have a group that wants a tour. We have so much history here, all kinds of history. And then get on Amazon and look it up, and if you're interested in early Everett history and my family history, I have a book called Mill Town Boy. It's based on the diaries from my dad, a couple hundred unpublished photos, and very interesting stuff. So a lot of history here in Everett and enjoy this absolutely gorgeous garden cemetery. Thanks. Everybody, thank you for watching today's tour of Historic Evergreen Cemetery in Everett with Gene Fosheim. Uh, he was kind enough to give us a tour and an introduction to some of the Civil War veterans that are buried here. There is over 150 approximately that are here in the cemetery. So what he did today just touches on the surface of the history that's here. Um, so I hope you come and visit, come see the GAR monument, visit the veterans that are here of the Civil War, historic Everett, World War II. Um, there's lots and lots of history here. If you're interested in 
more. Like Gene said, he offers private tours, um, get in contact with the Everett Historical Organizations um, and take advantage of that. And I just want to thank Gene one more time for showing us around a little bit. Um, and uh, we'll come back to you next time from Seattle again. Um, but we are going to be doing more programming, more content from, from some of the other cemeteries out of Seattle a little bit to kind of, kind of you know, s spread around what, what we're offering as far as is history. But uh, we look forward to uh, seeing you next time in Seattle. Thanks for watching.